Well, I refer to this little presentation as Lucy, she's no lady, and that's literally true. Current thinking is she's a male. <laughs> so right off the bat, we've pretty well established the premise of this presentation. This will be a critical examination of the Australopithecines, and particularly the Australopithecine, uh, Australopithecus afarensis. Don't let these big words fool you like Australopithecus. It simply means southern ape. When you see the word pithecus or pithecine, that means ape. And Australo means southern. So uh, we will talk about southern apes. This is a kind of a famous statue. It's appeared in a lot of t-shirts. It uh, was built at the time of uh, Darwin's uh, publication of Origin of Species back in around 1925. Uh, I'm sorry, at the time of the Scopes trial, 1925, getting ahead of my story here. And uh, we're not sure who uh, made the sculpture. The original's in St. Louis. It's a little bronze affair. It stands about 10, 12 inches tall. and. Uh, the ape, of course, is studying a human skull, which is a little backwards, isn't it? That's the humor of the whole cartoon. Uh, the ape has a caliper here with which to measure the skull. Uh, he's sitting on a book. Uh, the book down here is Darwin, it says on it, I presume, The Origin of Species. And he has his feet on a Bible. And the Bible is open to a page, and there we read the Latin inscription, which I won't attempt to pronounce because all Latin is Greek to me, and of course all Greek is Latin. But uh, it says there, or uh, makes a statement uh, that uh, Satan had given, you shall be as gods. Now, sometimes there's debate over this very starting premise. In fact, it was a debate at the time of the Scopes trial whether Darwin really said that man came from monkeys or not. Today, if you say that Darwin claimed man came from monkeys, uh, people will dispute that, and they'll say that evolution teaches that man came from ape-like creatures. An ape, by the way, is a monkey that doesn't have a tail. Uh, but Charles Darwin, in his book, The Descent of Man, did say that the Samayadeh then branched off into two great stems, the New World and the Old World monkeys. And from the latter, that is the Old World monkeys, at a remote period of time, the wonder and the glory of the universe proceeded so uh, don't let anybody tell you Darwin never claimed that man came from monkeys. He did, in fact, claim in this book that, he came, that we came from the old uh, world of monkeys. The Gallup organization has done a number of surveys to see what people think about evolution and specifically the origin of man. Uh, and in several surveys ranging from 1982 to 1992, and there perhaps have been more recent ones. I think the results are still fairly similar. Uh, the following four questions uh, were asked, or the following four choices were given. What do you believe about the origin of man? One, God created man in his present form at one time within the past 10,000 years. Two, man has developed over millions of years from less advanced forms of life, but God guided this process. Uh, three, same as above, except God had no part in the process. And four, uh, don't know, possibly don't care. Now, only three would be acceptable uh, to professional evolutionists. Evolution does not want divine assistance. Uh, if evolution were to require or even accept divine assistance to make it work, evolution would be in the same fix as creation, wouldn't it? couldn't teach it in the public schools because it would involve divine intervention. So the whole idea is that the evolutionary paradigm does not depend on divine intervention. The second choice is some kind of a combination of creation and evolution. Uh, anything from progressive creation to uh, theistic evolution. Well, the results of the poll are kind of interesting. About 45% of the people believe in creation. And this would be a, a quite literal creation that God created man in essentially his present form sometime within the last 10,000 years. Uh, theistic evolution, uh, or a combination of creation and evolution, uh, is also a significant number uh, of Americans, uh, something a little under 40% perhaps. The evolutionary view, which is taught in our schools and our textbooks and on TV and what have you, uh, holds less than 10%. Uh, uh, of the imaginations, I would say, 
uh, of Americans. It's interesting that only 10% believe what we teach in our textbooks, uh, and yet that 10% has a disproportionate impact, don't they, on our schools, on our newspapers, and I think on society at large. Relatively few people don't have an opinion on this subject. Uh, probably less than 5% these days uh, don't know or don't care uh, about this issue. So it is an important issue and one that bears our attention. In the evolutionary view, chance is really ultimately behind the origin of man and all else. Jacques Monod, who won the Nobel Prize for his work in biochemistry in a book called Chance and Necessity, said, chance alone is at the source of every innovation of all creation in the biosphere. Pure chance, absolutely free but blind, is at the very root of the stupendous edifice of evolution. Some uh, years ago, uh, Walt Stumper and I made a visit to the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago and they had just put on a multi-million dollar exhibit on evolution at the time. And uh, the exhibit had something uh, rather like a little gambling casino. And this casino was to emphasize the role of chance in evolution. Uh, on your uh, left there, you see uh, what's called a dice layout. Uh, they have these things in gambling casinos, uh, I've been told. And. Uh, <laughs> You throw the uh, dice out on the table and somehow these scores tally up and in America we call this game Crips. And over the top, as children throw the dice and what have you have fun with this exhibit, a sign reads, is life just a game of craps? That's kind of a heavy philosophical hit, isn't it? To lay on young people like you see here in the picture on the right, uh, typical of a lot of the visitors who are enjoying this hands-on exhibit. Uh, to hit them with the whole concept that their very existence, their mothers, their fathers, uh, their religion, everything, is just all one big game of craps. Uh, in the picture on the right, we see a one-armed bandit being vigorously cranked by the little gal. And above it, it says, over time, tiny mutations add up to big changes, suggesting, of course, that uh, these changes could produce amoeba to men. Now, mutations really do occur. Uh, do occur in man, and this is a sad thing because uh, chemicals and radiations that are mutagenic, that is, cause mutations, are oftentimes referred almost interchangeably as being carcinogenic, that is, cancer-forming. And as you sit here this evening listening to this lecture, the lights in the room are causing mutations to form in your skin. In fact, mutations are occurring spontaneously in your body at all times. And if these mutations were not repaired, most of the people I'm seeing in this room today would be long since deceased. Our very existence depends on a critical mutation repair system uh, that is a very complex system in the body. Uh, this system involves at least 12 different enzymes uh, that cut out and remove bad parts. Now, in this particular picture, we see what happens when this repair system doesn't work. This is a disease called xeroderma pigmentosa. Uh, one step out of perhaps 12 in the whole biochemical sequence for identifying mutations, cutting out the bad part, and splicing in a proper patch, one step is missing. And so mutations accumulate, such as melanoma here, and this soon pr proves fatal, fatal before reproductive age. In fact, DNA repair is so essential, it's now considered to perhaps be one of the explanations for longevity. Those organisms that live the longest have the most efficient mutation repair systems. Of course, it wouldn't be necessary to repair mutations before the fall into sin, would it? This is something that's a feature of this life after the fall.